Well, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, as you make your way there. Let me give you the title. We're going to be considering the ministry of being an ambassador. Daniel is a great example of that. Daniel chapter 1. Just make sure that's Daniel on your device, not uh, Mario. Just kidding. He's sort of. Okay, everybody there? Daniel 1, page 779. All right, well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship you. This was prayed earlier that we could draw near you and you us. What a blessing, Lord, that we have this great privilege of having access to your very throne of grace, that we might find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And we need you, Lord, to speak to us. And so we pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know each one of us. You love us. You know what we're facing. You know what we're going to face. You know the burdens on our hearts. You know the highs, the lows, the joys, the sorrows, the struggles, the victories. Lord, minister to us, we pray, by your Spirit. Equip us. Build us up in our most holy faith that we might be a blessing to you and to the church and to this world around us, our world that we might be ambassadors for Christ in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, Daniel chapter 1, we'll read the chapter in, in just a moment or two, but I want to introduce the subject. And Daniel, I think, is a great example of being an ambassador. Now, an ambassador, as you guys all know, but let me just give you a definition, is a diplomatic official of high rank, sent by one country to another country as its resident representative. It's an unauthorized representative. Now, the Bible tells us that we are ambassadors, each of us. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, and God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. And, and, and so then we are ambassadors for Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are God's authorized representatives to this world that we are actually citizens of, but we have a dual citizenship. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven now. Our names are written in heaven. We're citizens of heaven. We're citizens of another kingdom. And we're here still in this world as ambassadors for Christ. Now, of course, we all want to be good ambassadors, but that can be a challenge. We could, rather than being a representative of the world, we can become like the world, to be influenced by the world and the surroundings of the world and the affluence, especially in our day and age and in our present circumstances. And, you know, you've heard of an ambassador got into trouble and got kicked out of the country. <laughs> uh, so we want to be good ambassadors. We want to be good representatives of Jesus Christ. And I think Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel and his three uh, compatriots, his uh, three friends, you could say, co-ministers are a great example for us of being in a, a setting where there is a challenge of wealth, of affluence. And what I mean by affluence, well, we know what it means. It's just an abundance. It's wealthy. But the Latin word has the meaning of flowing toward. I, I like that, that definition because, you know, we, we have the sense of they're just so affluent. Everything flows their way. Everything goes their way. It's flowing toward them. They just have an abundance. They're in the flow. Man, they're, they've got the charmed life. There's affluence. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge to not be affected by that. And Daniel and his friends weren't. You've heard of the lotto winners that, you know, they go from poor to wealthy overnight, and it's not good for them. You know, we think that our problems are the, are the pain and struggles that we experience, but there's another kind of a difficulty, and it's called, it's called abundance, affluence, success, wealth. It can be a problem. And Daniel, again, is a great example. Daniel wasn't affected by the affluence around him, the setting that he was in. In fact, he seemed to thrive 
in his circumstances. And we'll read in, as we get into this chapter, that he and his friends were 10 times better than those around him. So they not only survived in their calling to be God's representative in Babylon, but uh, they thrived in it. So how did, how did he do it? How did they do it? I think he would tell us three things, and I'm going to give you these points now. We'll read the chapter, and we'll dig into it a little deeper. But I think Daniel would say, don't forget who you are, and then wisely pick your battles, and then recognize what God is doing, and go with that. Those three things. So let's read this chapter, and we'll get a little background about what's going on. Then we'll focus in on a few verses, verses 6 through 9, and these three things that, that allow Daniel and his three friends to be good representatives of the Lord, thriving in this world of affluence that they found themselves in. So Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to read uh, the whole chapter. So if you follow along as I read, I'm reading the New King James Version. Daniel 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your face your face is looking worse than the young men who are your age. Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away the portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they serve before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel began his ministry, and it continued all the way to King Cyrus. He 
thrived in this very affluent society that he found himself in, was taken to in Babylon, and all the wealth that was there, access to the, the king's delicacies and the wine, the education, and yet he thrived. He was successful. It was in the third year of King Jehoiakim, verse 1 again, a little bit of the background. King of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came and to Jerusalem and besieged it. This is 605 B.C., 2600 plus years ago. And most of you guys know the story. Jerusalem, because of their disobedience, is being chastised. And God uses Nebuchadnezzar to chastise his people, and they're taken into captivity. God, notice in verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. That's Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And then the king wanted to get the best and the brightest, you know, to bring them in to be their counselors. He wanted to educate them and train them that they might serve in the land, sort of uh, not only gleaning from the best, you know, around the world, which is a wise thing, but maybe, maybe they won't rebel in Jerusalem if you've got some hostages. In any event, Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are there. They're given new names. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. Daniel, he, he makes a stand. And I just find it very instructive the way Daniel handles his circumstances. And, and I think that, again, when you think about the world that we live in today, the affluence of the world, the the surroundings of the world, the temptations of the world, and our calling as citizens of heaven to be a representative of the Lord in this world. It's easy not to be taken in by the things of the world. It's easy not to be given over to the things of the world and jeopardize our witness and our testimony. So Daniel and again, his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were, they were successful. They were gifted by God, and God used them greatly then. And I think they're a great example for us today. So let's consider this a little bit more. How to be an ambassador. How to rightly represent the Lord with all of the influences around us. Well, the first thing I think Daniel would say to us is, don't forget who you are. And so notice again in verse 6, it's interesting how we read that their names were changed. Why? Why? <laughs> Why did they change their names? And, and I, I think that there's something here, and that is that they were given these names. These names have significance. They're their birth names, but now they're given Babylonian names. But will the name stick? It, it didn't with Daniel. And when we, you know, kind of look at these verses and, and, and ask ourselves, you know, what's going on here? I think that you, you'll, you'll maybe see that Daniel would say, hey, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. Daniel is Daniel. His birth name, Daniel, which means God is judge. Hananiah, Yah is gracious, or Yahweh, and uh, Mishael, who is like God, and Azariah is Yahweh helps. They were given these names. They were given the upbringing in their land as Jews. They were taught that God is the, is the judge. God is the one who says what's right and what's wrong, and God is gracious. And who is like God? There's no one like God. And, and God helps. What great names. And no doubt they were given that, that training that goes along with their names. And no doubt, you know, their parents. And, and again, these were uh, of noble stock. They were gifted. They were the best and the brightest. They were, they were of the nobles. And, and some think that they were of the royal family. They are sons of Judah. They're from the royal tribe. And yet they're given Babylonian names. Why? I keep asking that question. Why? What's going on? Well, we read that 
the king was to, or the king instructed the eunuch to train them and teach them the language and the literature of Babylon and then give them the, you know, the king's delicacies and the wine. And after three years of this training and this, you could say even indoctrination, they were to serve before the king. And a part of that is given a name. In, in a way, it's, it's, and I don't want to read into this more than what's there, but I just find it interesting that they're given these names. Now, I tried to get a consensus on the meaning of these Babylonian names, these Chaldean names, and every commentator I read had a different idea of what they meant. But you get the sense that, that they're being told, no, no, God's not judge. Bel is judge. No, no. Our gods are, are the ones that you're to follow now. Who is like our gods? Our gods are the ones that you're to follow. Our gods are the one that you're to serve. Yeah, your God helps, but our God is one you're to serve. And, and you get that sense that, that uh, when you look at the gods of the Babylonians or the gods of this world even today, uh, what a difference it is between the one true God, our God, and the gods of this world. Our God is gracious. Our God tells us what's right and wrong. He gives us the grace to do it. There's no one like him, and he helps us to do what he's called us to do. And we're in the new covenant, in the new covenant relationship where the Lord works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And the, there's no one like our God. And so... Again, the, the first point that I want to emphasize here is it would be easy, I think, and maybe I'm just putting myself there, it would be easy for them to forget who they are. Well, we're in Babylon now. We're in Babylon. They're, we're not in Jerusalem. And, you know, if you think about how easy it is when you're away from home how easy it is to be vulnerable to the temptations around you. When the kids go off to college, how easy it is for them to be influenced by their surroundings. You know, the guys that fall into sin, it seems that it happens on the business trip. They're away from home. Or, you know, we, we vote for a politician. They tell us, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And I believe in Christian principles. Okay, great, you're our guy. And we send them to Washington, and then they are influenced by Washington and they change. They change. What happened? They forgot who they were. What happens to our kids? You know, we, we raise them up in the ways of the Lord and then they get out on their own and then what happened? They forgot something. They forgot who they were. These guys didn't. They're sons of Judah. They're living up to their name. They're facing the temptations. You know, they could, have, they could have said, wow, this is a pretty good gig. I mean, all the king's delicacies, eat whatever we want, you know, first class all the way, a full scholarship, full ride, you could say, you know, in the best school. Man, and you know, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to be unappreciative. Or maybe they felt it. Maybe they faced the temptation of feeling entitled. Hey, I'm a, I'm a noble, uh, a son of a noble family. I'm a part of a, a noble tribe, a royal tribe. I should have the king's delicacies. I should have these things. Maybe they were tempted with feeling entitled. And it's easy. It's too easy, it seems for so many to forget who they are in the world that we're in. I had some friends when they were first saved, the Lord saved them, got them off drugs, got them from, away from the drinking party scene as he did in my life as well. And, and uh, the Lord healed my marriage and healed this, my friend's marriage. We were, we were close friends. They, got a, you know, they both got jobs and then they were able to get a house and and then wasn't long, man, they're buying furniture, doing the landscaping, and, 
and then they can't, they can't uh, make it to church because, well, the only day they could do the work on the house was, well, Sunday, and, and they missed it. Well, you know, you can miss a Sunday, but then they missed another Sunday, and then before long, they're just making money, you know, remodeling, doing the thing that everybody does in the world. They forgot that they were called Christians. They were called to be ambassadors for Christ. And it wasn't long that they totally lost their testimony. They lost their house. More than that, they lost each other. They wound up getting divorced over time. It took a couple years. They just sort of, you know, got caught up in the world. They forgot who they were. They, su they succumbed to the pressure of the world, you know, Hey, you're in Babylon now. <laughs> and they forgot who they were. We've seen it, and you've seen it with kids. They go off to college. They forget who they are. Somebody goes on a business trip. They're there to do business, not <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> or, the, again, the politician. So it's an issue, isn't it? It's a real issue. And how do, how do we continue in our ministry and be successful in it, well, we need to recognize that the world has an agenda for us. It's trying to, as it says in Romans chapter 12, it's trying to conform us. It's trying to press us into its mold. It's trying to fashion us. In fact, hold your place in Daniel. Now let's turn there real quick. Like Daniel, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12. Hold your place in Daniel 1. We'll go to Romans 12. In Romans 12, after 11 chapters of all the blessings of God and the mercies of God, saving them, justifying them, giving uh, this great gift of life and salvation as spirit and blessing and love, in light of, the, in light of all these mercies, we're told here in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And notice this in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice that. In light of all that God has done, Give your life to him. Put your life on the altar. Now, the problem with being a living sacrifice is that you could wiggle off the altar. It's a living sacrifice. You know, an altar is a place where they kill the animal. But we're living sacrifices. We put our lives on the altar. We say, okay, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you. But we could kind of, ah, it's, it's kind of hard on this altar, this life of self-sacrifice and self-denial. You can also be coaxed off the altar. You don't need to be on that altar. Get off that altar. We're in Babylon now. Come partake of the king's delicacies. And we could be coaxed off the altar. But we're encouraged to not be conformed to this world. We're not let the, as Phillips translates this in his paraphrase, don't let the world fashion you in, into its mold. And again, back in Daniel 1, They're, they're not, it's more than just an education. It's, it seems like it's an indoctrination. They're to be trained in all the ways of Babylon. They're given these new names. They're to, they're to eat, drink, and sleep Babylon. They're to be a part of this new world order system, this new life, so that they might serve uh, in, the, in Babylon in accordance with the ways of Babylon. But they didn't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't, that is, that they didn't forget who they were. And so how important it is to recognize that, that uh, what they faced, we face the same kind of pressure. The world tries to press us into its mold or fashion us or indoctrinate us. You know, what is the whole thing about, why is it so important to be PC? Why do we all have to conform with a certain way to speak and a certain way to act and a certain way to think? What's that from? Well, the Bible warns about all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. The pride of life, it's not of the Father. It's of the world. 
And the world wants to press us into its mold, fashion us. It wants us to think and live like the world. And we need to recognize that. And so the way to be successful against this is to not forget who you are in the world that's trying to influence you, that's trying to seduce you, trying to get you off of the altar and, and in the ways of the world, falling back into the ways of the world. And so how important it is to recognize. And this is the first, and I'm belaboring the point maybe a little bit too much, so uh, let me just s wrap it up and illustrate it, and then we'll move on. But it's important to recognize that the world will seek to change you. The world will seek to change your children. When you go to college, there is an, there is a, an agenda in, in this world, the way the world thinks, the way the world acts, what, the way the world is moving, the direction of the world. It's at enmity with God. Friendship with the world is at enmity with God. And, and we need to be warned, and we need to be warning about the influence of the world. We need to have our antenna up. We, we need to remember, wait a minute, I'm a son of Jude. I'm not a son of this world. We need to be careful. We need to be cautious. I am not of this world. Jesus said, my, I'm not of the, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight, but, but my kingdom is not of this world, and they're not of this world, and we're not of this world. We're Christians. We're from another world. We're part of another kingdom. But we have to we gotta be vigilant. And let me illustrate it like this. My name changed by the world. I was in the military years ago, and my name is on my fatigues in bold letters. My, my, the actual pronunciation of my last name is Marr. I go by John Mayer, you know, the famous musician guy. That's not me. <laughs> but I go, I go by John Mayer, but my, actually my name is pronounced John Marr. It's Marr. Now how did it change? Well, it's on my shirt. And you know, the sergeant says, hey, Marr, Mayer, get over here. And it's Marr, sir, I don't care what your name is. Get over here, give me 20, you know, that kind of thing. And I just, I, they wore me down. After a couple of years of, it's not Mare, it's Mar. You're like, Mar the table. It's Mar. Whatever. And I just stopped correcting. I, I just, I gave into it. And I didn't even realize it. And a couple of years later, I had, had been back east. My family's from back east on the east coast. I was there visiting my family. And, and uh, I introduced myself to somebody. I was with my sister, and I said, hi, I'm John Mayer. And, and she hit me. She says, your name is Mar. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's Mar. I'm John Mar. <laughs> my name changed. And I forgot, or they wore me down. I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to make too much of it, but it's an illustration how we can be influenced by this world that's that has a real agenda. You know, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5, 19. Again, all that is of the world, 1 John 2. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world is trying to press us into its mold. But for us, if we're going to be ambassadors, if we're going to be in the, as it says in Romans 12, 2, to you know, not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your, of your mind that you might affirm or prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If we're going to be in the will of God, fulfilling God's call and goal for our lives, we have to realize, man, the world has a definite agenda for us, for our children, for our church, for our friends, our neighbors, and we need to be alert to it. And Daniel, when you read through Daniel, he's called Daniel all the way through. They don't call him Belteshazzar. They call him Daniel. God is my judge, and I'm going to follow the Lord. And, and Dan, it says Daniel continued all the way to Cyrus, as we read at the end of the chapter. Daniel's ministry of 70 years, he was he somehow, well, we know how. It's by God's grace, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He was able to not forget who he was. What a great example. And so that's the first point. The next points better go a little quicker or we won't finish our Bible study. So the first point is how to, how to be an ambassador to rightly represent this 
this glorious gospel, this glorious life that we have in the Lord in this world that's trying to influence us by its affluence. Well, we need to not forget who we are. And then secondly, wisely pick our battles. Notice again in verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Notice he requested. It was a request, not a protest. He, he purposed in his heart. He didn't want to defile himself. And isn't it interesting, though, that he, he picked food? Food was the issue. Isn't that interesting? And we'll talk about why in a moment, but he picked food. Food that he didn't want to defile himself with the unclean food, the, the food that wasn't kosher, the food that he was called as a as a son of Judah, as Daniel, who, who God is judge, God says, no, this is what you eat, this is what you don't eat. This is what you drink, this is what you don't drink. And he picked food. That was the issue. That's where he, he fought his battle. And, and it's interesting to me. And I think too often we can be unwise in, in our battle picking. We want to wisely pick our battles. Too often we major on the minors and minor on the majors. Too often we draw the line where the line shouldn't be drawn and we miss it. And it's so, it's so important to wisely pick your battles. So he picked this issue of, I don't want to defile myself. I don't want to um, desecrate myself or stain myself. And he did it despite the risk of offending offending his host. I mean, he's getting this full-ride deal <laughs> to University of Babylon. Uh, it's, it's, it's way more than the terms of the risk involved. I mean, it's not just a loss of, of maybe promotion or friends or facing some ridicule, but he, he could lose his life. You don't just say no to the king of Babylon. Remember, the king of Babylon is the guy that put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, those guys, into the fire. It was Nebuchadnezzar that later killed the sons of Zedekiah, king of Judah, and, and then plucked out Zedekiah's eyes. Nebuchadnezzar is somebody that you didn't cross. When his wise men couldn't interpret his dream, couldn't tell him what his dream was and interpret it, he was going to kill them all in chapter 2 of Daniel. And so there is a lot at risk here. And Daniel, he makes this stand. He takes a stand here. And he, this, is the, this is the fight that he's going to fight. This is the hill he's going to die on. This is the issue. And I, I find it uh, fascinating and I think instructive. Why did he pick it? Why did he draw the line there? Wasn't his name? Wasn't his education? Hey, I can learn about, you know, different cultures, and I'll learn all of the knowledge of the world. I don't have a problem with that. Daniel was thinking. He must be thinking. It's not even his location. He's taken to Babylon. It's not even his new vocation. Okay, I'll I'll serve here. This is where I'm called to be. I'll do that. I'll go to this school. I'll get this education. I'll be in this location. I'll have this vocation. You can even call me Belteshazzar. But I'm not going to defile myself. I'm not going to violate God's clear instruction. I'm not going to violate my conscience and go against what God clearly says. I'm going to make a stand here. He, he purposed that he wouldn't defile himself or pollute himself. This food, no doubt, was offered to idols, dedicated to idols, to the, the food, again, wasn't kosher. I, I mentioned that. Leviticus 11 is a place where you could learn about what's clean and unclean if, if you're so inclined. You guys know a little bit of the background of the Old Covenant. They could eat certain foods. They couldn't eat certain foods. Isn't it interesting? Even the very beginning in the garden, the test was about food. Don't eat of that tree. And Daniel said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw the line here. I'm going to not have fellowship with the gods of this world. I'm going to be separate. I'm going to maintain my calling as a son of Judah. God is my judge. 
and I answer to him above all other gods because he is God. And so he picked the food. He wasn't going to violate his faith. I think that's an important principle. That, that's why. And, and then notice when he picked it. It was the first thing. I think it's instructive. It wasn't after. Well, let me try the food first and then you know, see how it goes with me. It wasn't, you know, the old joke about the guy that comes in and asks the pastor, so is it a requirement to tithe? And the pastor says, well, I'll tell you after the offering. <laughs> so the, the first thing he does, he's purposed in his heart. He's not going to defile himself. He hears about the, the program that's in store, and he's not going to do it. He's, it's like, it's, it, maybe even... He's anticipating, okay, they're taking me to Babylon. He's starting to hear about what they have in store for him. And he's thinking, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to maintain who I am, a son of Judah? How am I going to maintain my calling as God's minister in this new venture <laughs> that, that I'm in? And so he purposed in his heart ahead of time. He didn't wait. He didn't wait until the temptation was right in front of him. Uh, he, he picked it right away. He's, in other words, he's prepared. He's thought about this. He's, he's prepared ahead of time. And, and again, I think it's instructive. We need to prepare our kids. We need to prepare our friends. We need to prepare those that we're discipling. Hey, the world's got a plan for you. The world's thought it through. They have a strategy to, in, to fashion you. And so you're going to have to make a stand. Well, where do, you, where do you stand? Where do you make that stand? I love the, let me illustrate this idea about where to stand and how to make the decision with what Susanna Wesley said to her son, John Wesley. John and Charles Wesley used greatly of the Lord, but John asked his mother, this remarkable woman, he asked her, how would you judge the lawfulness or unlawfulness of, of a pleasure? And she says, use this rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sight of God, takes from you your thirst for spiritual things, or increase the authority of your body over your mind, then that thing to you is evil. By this test you may detect evil no matter how subtly or how plausibly temptation may be presented to you. Now, I was listening to uh, Ravi Zacharias give a sermon, in fact, I intentionally listened to it because I remember hearing it about the problem of pleasure, and he cites an essay, F.W. Borum's essay, and uh, he, I won't give you the whole deal, but just three, the three main points that, that he draws from F.W. Borum's essay on this issue, and there are these. So this is how you can determine, okay, where is God calling me to draw the line? What's, what's right for me or what's not right for me? And so the first principle is anything that refreshes you without distracting, diminishing, destroying uh, from God's goal for your life is a legitimate pleasure. Let me say that again. Anything that refreshes you without distracting you from God's goal. And he cites where Gideon's uh, being, uh, Gideon's men are being weeded down from the 10,000 to the 300. And it's the men that are drinking by the brook in Judges chapter 7. But they're, they're cupping and they're drinking from their hand and they're alert to their surroundings. It, it seems to be the idea there. And they're the ones that, that uh, are chosen. In other words, they're ref it's a legitimate pleasure they're refreshing themselves because they need to be refreshed, but they're not going to be distracted. They're alert to the dangers. And then the second one, any pleasure that jeopardizes the life of another is an illegitimate pleasure. Or any, anything that jeopardizes the sacred right of another. And he cites David's men bringing water from Bethlehem. I don't know if you remember the story, David. I wish I could drink from the water of Bethlehem. And, and just sort of a nostalgic moment. And, and so as men, they sneak off behind enemy lines, get the water, risk their own lives, and bring it back to David. David, here's the water from the well of Bethlehem. And David pours it out. I can't drink this. This is, you guys could have died. 
your life is sacred to God and to me. And, and I don't want to, I'm not going to have any pleasure that's going to jeopardize the life of another or the sacred right of another. It's an illegitimate pleasure. And then thirdly, any pleasure, however good, if not kept in balance, will distort reality or destroy appetite. Any pleasure, however good, if not kept in balance, will distort reality or will distort reality or destroy appetite. Proverbs 25, 16 is cited. If you find honey, eat it, but not too much, lest you vomit. So there's nothing wrong with having honey, just don't eat too much of it. And so, you know, how do you make decisions about what you're to do, what you're not to do? You know, how do you make sure that you don't major on the minors or minor on the majors? You need to wisely pick your battles, and, and Daniel did it. And then, thirdly, Daniel recognized what God was doing. Now, we read in verse 9, Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. God had brought. Daniel recognized something. We read in verse 2, remember, the Lord gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. God's doing this. God's behind this. God had brought Daniel into favor. Daniel's picking up on something. Okay, God's doing something here. He's brought us here, and yet, you know, I, have, I, I seem to have favor with this guy. He picks up on that. I, I find that instructive. He recognizes what God is doing, and he goes to that. He's thinking, it seems that he's thinking, and I'm, maybe I'm reading between the lines a little bit too much, but, it, you know, my thought in, in kind of thinking this through, he's thinking, I can't defile myself with the king's food. I, I'm a son of Judah. I, I, know what the world, I know what the world's up to. I know what they're going to try to do to me. I've got to maintain my ambassadorship. And, and he starts to look for a way to do that. Where am I going to make my stand? How is Daniel going to stand in the lion's den? How is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, these three guys, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, how are they going to stand in the fiery furnace? Well, there's this first test. And isn't it interesting that Daniel purposed in his heart, it says, but then the other guy said, yeah, we're with you. Now, were they the only four that came? Uh, I, there might have been 40. But these guys followed Daniel's lead, and Daniel's thinking, okay, where is it that I make my stand? What is God doing? And I think this is really instructive. You know, we're to be led of the Spirit. We, we pray for divine appointments. We want that way of escape that we can, you know, face the temptation. Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, God will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, and with the temptation will make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. What is the way of escape? So Daniel's, he's alert to his circumstances. He, he, he knows, okay, the world's going to try to change me, but I'm not going to forget who I am. I've got I to gotta make a stand where? Where do I make a stand? What is the Lord doing? And, you know, often it's, it's maybe something that we wouldn't think. When you first read it, you think, food, what's the issue with food? What's the big deal about the food? But he makes the stand. Because he realizes, okay, God had brought him into favor. I'm going to test this. I'm, I'm going to see if this is the Lord. And, and so he says, again, he's not going to violate the sacred right of, of another. He's not going to even put this guy at risk, Ashpenaz. You know, he says, hey, you got to do what the king says or... Not only will you be dead, I'll be dead too. And so Daniel says, let's test this. Put your servants to the test and see if, you know, if it doesn't work. Now again, or maybe not again, maybe I didn't mention this. The, the idea isn't the diet. Uh, you know, it's not like go on the Daniel diet. If you go on the Daniel diet, you're going to get fatter. They were fatter. <laughs> so that's not the point. The point is his faith, his example. He's, he's, he's testing this. If it's... If it's the Lord, and the Lord is in it, and the Lord blesses him and blesses them. And so Daniel knows somehow that God is with him like God was with Joseph when he went to Egypt. The Lord was with him, we read in Genesis 39. Daniel knows he's a son of Judah. He knows that God's going to make a way of escape. He knows he's got to make a stand. He knows he can't forget who he is, and so he's looking. He's attentive. He's, he's wise in that regard, and God blesses that. 
God knows, or Daniel knows that God will show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal. It says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Well, I'm out of time. So let me tell you what I was going to tell you if I had more time. <laughs> I know that doesn't work, but let me just conclude with an illustration. Eric Little, uh, how many know about Eric Little? Curious. A few, okay. Eric Little, uh, back in the 20s, was a, the flying Scotsman. He was a Christian. He wound up uh, being a missionary to China. And, but in the 1924 Olympics, he won the 400-meter uh, race, and, and uh, he got the gold medal. Well, he was slated to run the 100. And he found out about six months prior to actually going to Paris, where the Olympics were, he finds out it's going to be on the Lord's Day. And he had this conviction that he can't, he's, he's to serve the Lord on the Lord's day. He's to be in church on the Lord's day. And he can't, he, he can't violate that. He can't violate this deeply held conviction. Others may, he, he's not going to. So he says, I can't run the 100 meter because the heats, some of the heats are on Sunday. And the Olympic committee tries to pressure him. Come on, you know, it's, God understands just one day. It's the Olympics. You know, what's the big deal? He says, I can't do it. And he doesn't. But he thinks, well, maybe the Lord wants to do something else. And so he starts to train for the 200 and the 400. And he has about six months to train. Now, remember, he's a sprinter. He's the 100, but he... He trains for the 400, which is a middle distance. It's, it's a totally different kind of running. And he trains for it, and then he, he does the qualifying heats in London, I believe. And he actually wins. And he's selected to represent Great Britain in the Olympics. And he runs the 400, and he wins the gold. And we remember him. Many know about him. And he had a great testimony. Why? Well, because he stood his ground. He stood his ground. If he would have ran the 100, he probably would have lost, violating his, you know, his conscience and his convictions. God can't bless that. And, you know, but he didn't. He, he stayed true, and God blessed his, his venture. And we remember him. He wouldn't have been remembered if he would have ran the 100. And he had a great ministry and great opportunity to proclaim the gospel. So we're called to be ambassadors in this world. And it's easy for us to, too easy for us to forget who we are. Don't forget who you are. Wisely pick your battles. Recognize what God is doing. You know, maybe somebody's thinking, and I'm concluding now, I really am. My third and final conclusion Closing my Bible, putting my notes away. You know, we can think, well, I'm not a Daniel. I could never be like that. Well, Jesus said to Peter, a fisherman, just your everyday guy, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And if we'll just follow the Lord, if we'll not be taken in by the glory of this world, but we'll set our affections on things above, we're not of this world. We have our hearts on the Lord. We'll, if we'll just follow the Lord, he'll, he'll make us what he's called us to be. He'll give us the grace and the strength to do it. So if, you're, if you don't remember anything, remember that. How are you going to make it in this world? And if we'll just follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you. Philippians 2.13, it's God who works in us both to will and to do. God does the, the willingness of it and the doing of it. He, and we just, okay, I'm going to follow you. You'll give me the grace to do it. And, and then when I stumble you'll, and cry out to you, you'll pick me back up, dust me off, and and I'll follow you some more, and, and I'll learn, and I'll grow. If we'll follow Jesus, we'll just follow him, be in that close relationship with him, follow hard after him, abide in him, stick close to him, you know, keep our hearts and our minds on heaven, not on the things of this world, we'll make it, and we'll have a a, a growing testimony as his ambassadors in this world of affluence is trying to ruin us and rob us of this glorious high and holy calling 
that's ours in, in Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, let's stand together. Lord, help us, we pray, to, to be ambassadors in this world. Help us to not forget who we are. Help us to wisely pick our battles. Help us, Lord, to see what you're doing and, and go with the flow. Yield to that and, and follow you. To know where we're to make our stand. Trust that you'll give the grace and the strength to do it. Help us to, to see you, Lord, and to follow you. That you would do that work that you must do in us. We just want to follow and yield and surrender and and not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of, of our minds, that we would walk in your will, that we would be fulfilling this wonderful, glorious calling as ambassadors of the kingdom of God in this world that so desperately needs you. In Jesus' name, amen.